Concentrate on skill. This is why for me, I won't worry too much about, you know, high performance, hockey specific training at these age groups. By all means, be doing stuff and have your hockey experts give you advice, but it's more a smorgasbord of games. Body exercises, lots of obstacle courses. You want to challenge the brain whenever you exercise, not just do some meaningless stuff that bores them silly. Remember, they want to have fun. Okay, show you that one. I really want to drive this point home to you. So this is some classic work. Robert Molina is one of the finest physicians to do with exercise pediatrics. Claude Bouchard is a phenomenal genetics researcher, um, big part of the Harvard studies out of the University of Montreal. Okay, quite some old data here. What they did with this particular group, they brought a bunch of guys in, and they asked them to pull, and the reason why I chose this graph is there's no skill involved. They're pulling on a steel cable with a tensionometer, so they know how much force can be introduced. They then actually divided the guys into early, average, and late matures, as determined by X-ray of the hand. So you can tell the biological age of someone by looking, as I told you earlier, by the age of the bones, so by whether or not the growth plates are closed. So they can tell the age. So one of the key things for you is immediately, all the kids end up at the same place in the end. But of course, if you want to win at 14, okay, and this particular aspect is to do with strength, and you say that's important for whatever sport you're involved with, I'm not saying it's necessarily hockey, okay, you're going to pick that top line. The middle line will get an idea, well, I'm going to keep trying, because I'm not too far away, and the bottom line will get the message that they suck, and they're going to give up, and their parents are saying, why am I spending 400 bucks a week on you playing hockey? You know, you suck, let's not do that anymore. Let's, let's take up chess. We keep going, keep going, keep going. They naturally get here, and I can show you the evidence because you can see the trajectory of the green line, that there is a huge body of evidence that shows that the later developers overshoot and outperform the early developers. Food for thought, huh? Another reason for keeping kids in as long as possible. Remember, I'm ruthless. I want to know where Team Canada, I want to know where there's 23 to 25 guys and girls are coming from. But at the moment, this system is fucking me up, to be quite blunt. Because we don't get to see not only the early guys, you don't want to throw them out, there may be outliers there that will survive through the system all the time. Worst at the moment is, it's only that orange line that's coming through. We get that group through to 17 and 18 because everyone else has fallen by the wayside. It's a challenge for us. Worse still, we just don't keep kids in the sport. So I hope some of this stuff brings it home to you, of what we're trying to do. What does that first five years of hockey look like? Because I guarantee it's a lot different than what we're doing currently. And as I said, we're getting our asses handed to us by the Americans. So physical literacy, here's a classic example, the difference between chronological age, that's the stopwatch of life. So when a kid's born, you start the stopwatch. Tick, 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 tick. So remember, age, as we define it, is a man-made construction. The calendar's man-made, compared to biological age, which is the biological clock under ticking, driven by both the environment and the underlying genetic matrix. These kids are all 14 years of age. All 14. Who do you think's winning right now? He's a gymnast. Well, look at that guy on the right. He's like a mini Adonis. He's like some Greek god at 14. He can do an iron cross without even blinking. Little kid on the left can't even get on the pommel horse. So you can imagine this. At 14 years of age, remember I showed you where they're growing at the greatest rate? But they're growing at different rates. At 14 years of age, so that group is um, the 2003 borns right now, okay? 14, you can have easily the largest biological spread of age in that single group. So all the 2003s, you could easily have a 48-month biological spread. So you could be looking at a 12-year-old versus a 16-year-old, and you're wanting to compare them. And worse still, we do stupid shit, pardon my language, we even have two-year age groups. So we make it even worse for ourselves at times. And who makes those decisions? We do, the adults because we're ignorant. I mean that in a nice way, we just don't know 
That's why I, people like me, and there's loads of us, want to help you design good systems, do the best things for your kids. And yes, I'm a mercenary. I want to find the best in the end, but I have to have the patience. I, I spent the last four Olympic cycles, four years in the Salt Lake, Torino, Vancouver, and Sochi, Director of Sport Physiology and Strategic Planning for Canada's Winter Olympic Sports. Very lofty title. And the reason why I really started to invest a lot of time into growth and maturation, sat down with four others and wrote Canadian Sport for Life in 2003, 50 years after the East Germans had their program in place. Don't think it was all to do drugs. They did the right things, then manipulated a few things. All the Russians, or the Czechs, or as we watch the Americans increasingly with their ADM, now endorsed by the USOC, the United States Olympic Committee, and all 45 of their member federations. Pretty damn scary, because when the Americans move, they move. Okay, think about competition to finish. By all means, assess. See where you are. It's like doing a gap analysis. Where are we? Where do we want to go? Have you got a picture in your mind of what your six-year-olds need to look like in March? Because part of that is to make sure that we're getting them ready to have a great summer and get ready to be seven and come back saying, coach, I want to be in seven-year-old hockey now, or whatever you want to call it. Then you go through the intervention of what you're teaching with them. You have some kind of exam, just like in school. Do the work. You have a midterm, check up on things, do some more work. You have some pop tests and all that type of stuff, aka okay, competition, and then you have the big exam at the end. And you want to make sure in any minor association, every child in the association is playing hockey for as long as possible. You do not need to mimic the Stanley Cup playoffs. We're on the first weekend, or after the first series, 50% of the kids aren't playing anymore. So usually in the minor levels, 50% of the kids aren't playing hockey after the first weekend. And you still got the rest of March. Now you get involved in tournaments and exhibitions. Now the cost goes up. Oh, oh, but the kids have great fun. We go to a hotel and there's a water slide and all this shit. How many water slides do you have to go to at age six before that becomes a little bit passe? Really? And how much money? Think, think of this. Think of this aspect. I live in Cochrane, a little town just outside Co uh, Calgary, right? We've got 1,000 players registered, about 200 girls, 800 boys. Imagine if we did this. It costs about $1,000 to play, okay, without any of the travel and all that other stuff. $1,000 to register. But imagine if we made it 200, 1200 bucks. Because I guarantee every one of those parents is spending another two, two and a half, three thousand dollars $3,000 without even blinking. That's before even doing a little skating camp in the summer. So we had 200 bucks, 1,000 kids. We have $200,000 extra in the kitty. That's just for this one minor association. You imagine what kind of development program we could run with $200,000. We could employ the very best of the age group coaches. Who are the world class, class coaches of six to eight year olds? Imagine. Use your resources widely. You're spending a lot of money. Think where they could be spent. So competition, very important. And one of the ones you do, the week in, week out rigmarole, I'm not too fussed with that. The kids are trying to learn something. And look at your practice to game ratios and how much puck contact did a kid have? How much standing around during practice time? How many lines do you really need? And then what actually is inherent in hockey? How do you ensure that a kid has maximal time doing and maximal time with the puck with them? Maximal time changing direction, learning to skate, making decisions even as their brain grows. And I can assure you, it's not like bees in a honey pot rushing up and down a vast, unscaled ice surface that's built for adults. Why is it when you go to an elementary school, all the furniture's small? Because the kids are small. They all, if you go outside and look at the bicycle rack, the bicycles are small. You go to the washroom, the urinals are low down. The sinks are down. We, why is it we don't understand scaling? We turn this sport that's built for adults into something that is unrecognizable. They're not producing energy that way. They're not capable skill-wise, mentally, from the brain point of view, and certainly from the power point of view, or even the ability to skate, and we do that to them. Give me a break. 
when the most vital thing we want to understand is ultimately, even though it's a team game, it's what a kid can do with the reach of their stick, or if they're a netminder, with the reach of their leg, the reach of the hand, the reach of the hand with the stick. It's this area that they control. And they need to be able to do by 14 years of age, because typically by 14 years of age, roughly speaking, someone's been in an activity six or seven years on a reasonable basis, you will see that all the motor patterns that they will eventually have as a senior. So they should be able to do absolutely anything with that puck on their own. And then you impose the demands of someone hanging off them as they try to get down the ice, or two against them, and whatever it might be. And even then, the, the pass, the accuracy of the pass is set within this circle that they control, just like that little boy with the soccer ball. In this domain, he controlled the ball perfectly. If you can't do that, you're not gonna do it when it counts. So that should be the objective for us as we come through. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Sorry the puck, show me what you can do. Now I'm gonna add a challenge. One against you, two against you, three against you, four against you, I don't care, take the puck away from you. You keep it. Netminder, what can you do? You've got shots coming at you, left, right and center. So think about what it looks. The only other thing I would say to this at times is this one. If this was where the previous exam was on the first diagram, right, that was the end point. If you do that sometimes, they might be carrying a lot of fatigue. One of the biggest problems you have is that the timetable that you're fighting is the school timetable, which doesn't give a damn about you. So one of the problems you have to understand, particularly around the hormonal system, is kids going into their exam periods are highly stressed, and stress doesn't matter where it comes from. It could be physical, it could be mental. And if I were to show you L-glutamine, a particular amino acid, kids going to exams, L-glutamine starts to drop, and down here somewhere they're gonna get sick or injured. So if you're starting to do things right on top of the approach into exams or the exam period, you're hooped. You're hooped. So you need to stay away from those in terms of whenever you're gonna do something really intense. So just think about your calendars, and that's right through the age groups, right to the end of high school, even into university actually, but for you as age groups, be very careful around what's happening with the school calendar. This is the other reason where lots of sports do this. As Soon as school's out, everyone does some kind of camp immediately after school finished. Right at a time when their immune function is through the bottom of the floor and suddenly you ask them to do more work than normal. Recipe for disaster. They will either get sick or injured or both. So at the very least, instead of doing that, you know, you get to Easter. Oh, let's have a big camp, big tournament. Kids are shot to health. They've just had exams and God knows what else in school. You suddenly do this to them. At least give them a couple of days break. Even better to do maybe a shorter camp with more quality, having given them a break, than a longer camp. So I'm just trying to show you how complex in terms of the calendaring about your children this actually is. So don't worry about that. Well, the only thing I was trying to show here is that um, best to put the final exams late in the season. And instead of having a pyramid decline of, of teams going through knockout, always have some kind of repercharge so that everyone in your minor association finishes hockey at the same period of time. Just to finish, the dashboard. What is important on the dashboard of a six-year-old is different than the eight-year-old, different than the 10-year-old, different than the 12. And part of our job is to make sure they really enjoy this year and learn a lot of stuff, but they, you are preparing them for the next period of their life. Okay? Don't worry about that diagram. I'm going to stop this. Don't worry about this. I'm going to get to this. Oh. People, programs, places. Let me just say, that's my contact information. Welcome to have it. Here's the thing. I want to stress this to you. It's always about people. You are the resource. It's the programs you design and implement with your kids. Don't worry too much about the places. You can do a lot of hockey without even going near the ice. And when you go near the ice, try not to stand still on it and use it having learned what you were going to do before you arrived. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I don't know if there's something. Thanks, Steve, for uh, that presentation. If there are any specific questions of Steve's presentation or clarifications that uh, Steve provided, then uh, we'll take them now. And uh, if you have that question, I'll bring the microphone to you. Great. 
Steve, I think this is the second time I've seen you. I think you were a bit more passionate at the OHF workshop that we had. Uh, so, so I, 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 I don't know if it's jet lag, but, 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 but welcome back. Um, in, in terms of what you've outlined, like how much of this do you think parents understand? And, and if it's not a whole lot, which I think it is, how do we educate them? What's, what's the vehicle to, to sort of get this kind of information out to parents so that they are, are partners with us that run the programs so you're not fighting with, you know, it's my kid, right? And, you know, you, you don't tell me what to do with my kid. So how do we get, what level of education do they have on any of this, right? And how do we improve that? First off, this, this, it's so rare. So rare that you get this opportunity. So for me, one, we should be doing more of this for a start. We should um, really educate key people in each of the areas so that it's almost that sort of ripple effect. You can talk to whoever else is and, and we provide resources um, with, you know, with technology these days. We could get a few hundred people on a, on a, uh, on a webinar and be able to talk back and forth. But I do think this face-to-face, -face, I, mean, I mean, this only happened to me. I was only told about this on the weekend, right, I think. We started talking about it and said, yeah, absolutely, I'm coming. So, you know, just floor everything else. This is way too important. And so these opportunities, and not simply for me to talk, I mean, tonight it was really me talking about, but the, the key thing is to be able to sit down and, well, Steve, these are the actual challenges in our area, what we do. Here are the resources we have, blah, blah, blah. This is where the kids are. This is where the coaches live. You know, and really look at what, because although the basic information fits the entire country, there are different landscape aspects. Travel time, I mean, it took us an enormous amount of time to get from the airport to Humber College. I mean, it's ridiculous. So you could walk it faster than we actually drove it. So there are those type of things compared to living in my little town in Cochrane, right, where it's like you know, 30 seconds from one end of the town to the other, right? But so it's important that this happens. And I think there's a commitment now with, with Tom, and certainly I know Corey goes around the world, uh, around the, the country, but I mean, this is what the Americans have done, you know, and they're five to eight years ahead of us, and they're 20 years ahead behind the Czechs already, and the Swedes and the Finns have been doing it for quite a while. And so, you know, it's not that we have to copy. We, you can't take a system from here and dump it there and vice versa. We've got to look at what are the cultural differences. But, you know, if I added up the hockey experience in this room, I mean, we're at hundreds of years in this room. I, I don't mean to say you're old. I'm just saying you're experienced, okay? Hundreds of years. We should be able to solve any issue in hockey, any and when it comes to your precious ice time, if you understand how to use the ice surface more, the kids get more, and it's actually cheaper as well, if you really organize it. So for me, it's about getting in front of you, me giving you some information at times, and others, there are other people in other domains, but then having the dialogue. What, what's gonna work? How can we make this work? Do you have high school hockey going on and other things? Do you have hockey skills academies or whatever else? What can we do to in totally raise the game? Because that's what I'm about. It's not a question of being confrontational, it's about how can we help each of the minor associations raise their capability when we're relying very heavily on volunteers who have real lives and do other jobs and you know and they're giving up time to do this so what do you really need to know and one of the things I've been most concerned about is our coaching models are very linear and what we've got to get into our minds is you actually coach to your audience so what you want to be is we want to start to look at our coaching models where we have coaches that are U10 coaches and they're very very good at understanding that progression from six through to 10 years of age. Then we get the sort of middle ground, and then we've got everyone, you know, they want to be the high performance coach up here. But for me, high performance isn't until you get to the highest level. Even world juniors is not high performance. You couldn't take the vast majority of those kids out and put them in the NHL and then play more than one game. Not gonna happen, right? So they're still a development, they're a performance development stage. But we use words like, I guarantee this weekend in, in tomorrow, we go to somewhere in Calgary and there will be a high performance program for a bunch of five-year-olds. I mean, it's pathetic. The only thing that should be high performance is the quality of instruction, okay? So I think this is fabulous, really do, okay? Thanks, Steve. Um, I, you said some great things in there. I appreciate you coming here. Um, I, one of the things you said that I really like is know what you know, know what you don't know, and if I may paraphrase, find someone who knows, right? Absolutely. Um, w w I got to tell you, I'm coming from a club called Faustina, um, and I'm a volunteer. 
And uh, I've got lots of background in physiology and whatnot. I loved all this. I was like as in university again. However, we're here tonight to address something about six-year-olds and our programs that I will admit in, at Faustina hasn't been that great. And that's why I volunteered to, uh, to change the program so that it's more like the IP program because I think that the kids are going to learn a lot more. So the bit about know what you don't know. I don't know a lot, right? So I started looking for who are the people that should know. Now one of those bodies that I thought would be able to really help is Hockey Canada. It was pretty tough. I spent three months trying to find stuff that would help me develop the program because that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a really, you know, I'm, I'm putting my life into this and I'm going to roll it out as best as I can and we're going to, we are going to try and get this, you know, to be a great program. I spent three months trying to find good material. There's the Hockey Canada manual for IP, correct? Now, it took me a long time to get it because when I tried to order it, it wasn't available from the person that prints it till September. Mm. All right? When I phoned Hockey Canada, I talked to some people. They said they deferred me back to GTHL because that's where we are. And then even here, it took quite a while to get a manual. Mm. All right? Now, I've been, I've been looking at the Hockey Canada network app. All right? And I've been saying, okay, I can, I've, you know, take some, it's a learning curve. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of developed things so that I can make a practice, get my volunteers in there and say, all right, now, to get more information, to get creative, to get down on a level of the kids, let's go to the Hockey Canada Network app and figure out what the drill should look like. Have you found it, guys? Have you found the drill that says this is what a C-cut should look like? If you're going to coach six-year-olds, have you found it? Is it there? Absolutely. Is it there where I can look at a video, not a description, because we're all different learners here, right? Is there a video there that looks what, the, this is a proper Sika. If, you know, it, well, then this is what I'm talking about. I mean, if you are trying to, if I, I'm doing my best to roll mm -hmm. set to six-year-olds, I will do my darndest to make this a great program and we got lots of volunteers who are going to also do that. Now, if Hockey Canada wants to roll it out, I think that they have to have the information to coaches in their hands, not three months before, not six months before, not a year before. Like, we should have, I should have had this stuff a long time ago. It should have been plain. It should have been on the tip of my tongue. All right? I, so we're behind the eight ball. Okay? And I think that most of us here, as coaches of six-year-olds, tyke that we are here because we are moving towards that. We're doing our best to do that. We are all, I think, at House League trying to do this. So you might be you know, preaching to the converted here. We know that there should be changes, right? So with that, I got to say to the Hockey Canada guys that you know, you're part of, let's do a better job. Yep. You are the guys that should know. And when, when people are making calls from grassroots organizations, you know, we should have this stuff in our hands as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we're willing to spend the 50 bucks on the manual, but the people in Elmer, Ontario says it's not available, this shouldn't happen, right? So there's a bit of frustration. Fair enough. But we are working towards IP, right? And we didn't do IP at Faustina, but we are going to do it, right? And we are going to get lots of people involved with it. I think what we're here for tonight, though, is not that we're not doing this. We are going to be doing it. I think that everybody here is be, he, to talk about a sort of other issue that's on the table, and it is our select program and what's happening with, with that this year. So I'm wondering, is anyone going to start talking about this coming up? Is anyone else here for that? So is that what's coming up? Okay. All right. Because I think, so, so my point is, let's get, let's get the information from the people who should know. So, appreciate that and appreciate the comments. Are there any questions towards Steve's content that he's going through? We're going to get to that other stuff. 
afterwards. So any questions on Steve's content? One second here. One second. Um, it's poor credit hockey. We're part of the Mississauga Hockey League. Um, I, what you're saying, fine. We do the IP relative to the practice. Uh, we have been playing full ice. Um, we will change. Obviously, there's a mandate. But I've been doing this 25 years. I've had three boys play uh, rep, and they're still playing in what you referred to as beer league. Um, I think you're putting a tremendous, and I know your goals, and, and if you don't do your job, you're going to get fired if they don't win. It was all on the fan this morning about Americans. And America's ten times the size of us. Let's be realistic. I know this is our game. But you're putting a tremendous pressure on volunteers. That's the biggest, anybody that's in here that's got house league, Faustina, any of the guys here, Duffield, it's getting coaches at that five to eight years at nine, we turn them over to the GTHL, the AA, the AAA teams, that's gone. But to get volunteers to do what you want to do, we're going to need a tremendous amount of help. And to follow the comments of the gentleman, Faustina, we, I, liked, I went to order the, the borders, the, uh, what do you call it, the dividers, uh, and I was told by the city of Mississauga, not because we have to store them somewhere. This is just a little bit of logistics. And they're not, we don't know if they're fire retired. And if they're not fire retired, Mississauga won't let us store us in the arena. So where am I going to, if I've ordered two, where am I going to? So these are some of the things relative to the implementation that, you know, and whatever. But again, my point is, relative to this age group, these are all volunteers. And you have some people that have hockey experience but at least 50% of us, and I'm one of those that started way back when, you know, did the programs and whatever. You're putting a lot of pressure on these people to perform with children that they're really not qualified. And to ask that is a big measure. And if you want to say that you're going to create high performance, I mean, I don't know if you've been following Ontario soccer, but their house league is sort of stagnant and their reps are going up because parents are not happy. And that's what bothers me, that 10 years from now, that our house league may not look the way, at least at poor credit, because I can't provide the, the coaches that have the knowledge that you're looking for us to do. Very simple. Yes, let me address this. So, okay, we use the high performance aspect as, uh, as an endpoint, a lagging KPI. But I, I hope very clearly I spoke about every child. For me, I find it absolutely abhorrent that certainly in that first decade, there is a difference between recreation and competitive sport. This is actually a strangely North American phenomenon that's actually occurred. Okay, so hockey is hockey as far as I'm concerned. It's just a continuum. And as to putting a lot of pressure, all I'm actually saying is you're spending a lot of time doing hockey already. Just have a slightly different focus in the type of content. And if we can put, by having better communication, getting materials in your hands, then we will equip our largely volunteer force with the ability to do these things. It's not difficult, it's just a slightly different direction. There's no suggestion of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And it is about every kid, because I stated very clearly that one of the key performance lag metrics is to have as many children, youth, playing hockey at the end of high school. Every one of them, if we can. That should be a metric for us. We should actually have a, a rectangle of participation, not a pyramid. And certainly we can overlay high performance aspects later on, okay, when it starts to become important. But it's actually about making sure that at five, six, seven years of age, we equip all the volunteers with the information they need. They don't have to be phenomenal experts, but because one of the key things that we have to do is actually, interesting enough, equip everyone with how to create the environment for kids to learn. Not just simply how do you actually perform a particular technical move. That's important as well. But how do you actually create the environment that the kids will thrive in? And that's not by necessarily doing flow drills left, right and center with them. So please, uh, please understand very clearly, now I'm adamant about this. Even though I may, and you, you talk about me being fired, it's not, that's not going to happen around this, I'll go long before then. 
is the issue to do with every child is an athlete, every last one of them. It's just a kind of, I love tennis, right? But there's seven billion people on the planet and I'm ranked about six billionth. Okay, so I'm not gonna make a living out of playing tennis. Same with all the kids that start out playing hockey. The key thing is, are we instilling in them a lifelong love of the game and a reasonable level of competency? And the ones that are gonna come all the way through, they're gonna come all the way through. The hallmark for all of us is this. The hallmark of good teaching by volunteers or professionals is this, is that you are able to elevate whoever you're dealing with. So you take the averagely good kids and you make them much better. You take the good kids and make them great, you make the great kids phenomenal, and you stay the hell out of the way of the Conor McDavid's, who are four standard deviations away from the norm. That's what we're talking about here tonight. Now yes, we're gonna have a discussion around the select programs, because I understand very late on that this has been a bit of a bone of issue and there's some timing issues, but it's really nothing to do with me per se. I'm just trying to talk to you about equipping you. But I do take an objection to this because I've tried to state very clearly about doing the right thing for kids, no matter who they are, that's all. And we, yes, I agree, we do a poor job of getting the stuff in your hands. We've got to do a better job around that. Okay. I think, uh, is, is it pertaining to the physiology? That's I mean, we've been... I, I can speak loud at all. Okay, sorry. Um, so, Steve, uh, we, uh, you know, I heard what Tom said about uh, lack of, uh, of uh, a failure to make the leap of faith and, and uh, to accept the change and, and get one's head around cross-ice hockey. Our organization, we've been doing it for 25 years. We, we've been doing cross ice with the little guys since, well, my oldest is 30 and I was doing it before him, so, um, and, we, and we do it. So we got our heads around it. We believe in it. We think it's, I mean, it's the small space, small bodies, all of that. But our program is four to six-year-olds. 25 years ago, it was probably six to eight-year-olds, but now it's four to six-year-olds, right? And, and that's what I'm dealing with. Every Saturday morning, we have 300, but at the arena I run, I have 110 kids on Saturday morning, all from four to six. And so it's all the small ice stuff. It's, we've been using blue pucks since they invented blue pucks and, and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, after two years of that, so our, the kids are hitting house, they get age six. And they've had two years of that. And, you know, and we focus on no one's going to the NHL. It's all about fun. If every kid doesn't get out of bed Saturday morning and want to go to the arena, then you failed, right? And then this, we tell parents, don't do any hockey in the summer. Soccer, get outside, do all that stuff. And all that, at the end of the two years, I see these kids, and you've exposed them all to the same influences, and some are timorous, you know, some are, are tentative, and some, usually those with older siblings, you know, if I'm hearing the pucks behind me, they're going through me, you know, it's their puck. And it seems to me that every six-year-old is six-year-old emotionally, physio physiologically, but in terms of attitude and, you know, kind of gung ho whatever you want to call it, they're different. And it seems to me that some are ready for, for a more challenging environment and, and we run a house league, that's our focus. And we wanna keep all the kids in house league, but we also offer the select program for those other kids. So what, I do, what do I do with my six-year-olds who have had two years of that and then graduate to house league, and some are quite talented? This will lead into where Corey's going. So for me, you see, I, I wouldn't make this distinction, okay? So house, whatever. It's a continuum. This is where actually tiering is one of the best possible things in sport. It's like having different rankings of, of uh, swimming qualifications. You know, if you swim this fast, go to this meet, and so forth and so forth. There's a challenge. The issue is around whether tiering is around competency or simply around competition, and there's a difference. So the key thing for me is tiering, you know, you're going to grade, you're going to have, in any age group, you're going to have the kid that happens to be the best at the moment through to whoever is a bit off the back of the bus at the moment. Okay, all the way through, as you said. Attitude plays a big part. And so the idea of, of a tiering component, it, 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 I, don't, I don't find a, a tour problematic. The issue is, is there the ability to constantly change the tiering as the children grow, or do they get locked into a system? Or does a particular tier start to get more resources than another? Because then the gap will widen, and then you do, coming back to my issue around finding the best, it becomes a foregone conclusion of who stays in the system. And if you do that very early in life, they may not be the good ones. And then if you are interested in performance at the highest level, 
you're left with people that aren't necessarily very good. So tiering is a good thing if it's used well. And in fact, if you just looked at all your kids when you have them in and you do an assessment okay, on your kids of how well the program is behaving, you would have a rank of them. I don't think that's a problem at all. It's how it's utilized. And the problem is how the adults then view that. We're, we're the kings and queens of comparison. You know, the, the kids themselves aren't necessarily as wrapped up in it. And your issue about the mind is an extremely important component to that, the desire. But it's not always there from day one. Some kids acquire that over time. They get the, whatever turns their crank at a certain age or turns their fire. But it is important. So I don't have a problem with tearing at all. I think it's a good thing if it's used well. Before we go into Corey, I think to go off the edge of that question is, I don't think it's about tiering is the question. The question is, once you tier to the best, even at six, should you go to full ice? So because they've been tiered to select, should they still be playing on half ice or should they be going to full ice? The tiering is something that you're, you're using to help you in assessment, but they're still six or seven years of age and still trying to do the right thing for them. It's just the expectations, and this is, this is where you, as people who are dealing with them, need to use your imagination and creativity to provide the challenges. We can provide some examples of what that might look like, but it's just about moving them along, because they're still six and seven. They're not suddenly 26 years of age. You know, they're still, their, their energy systems, their musculature, all those components are still six and seven. Okay, I think we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna stop the questions right here. We're gonna get Corey to go on and do some discussions about it. And if you want to uh, give your mic over to Corey, and uh, Corey's gonna give us some concepts on how we can provide that programming, how you can be creative in giving that programming, the tools that are available, that exist right now, and that are available to the associations uh, with regards to cross ice and half ice programming. And then we'll get some questions again following uh, Corey's presentation. And uh, at that time, we'll also bring up uh, Scott and Don and uh, Ian and uh, bring them into the conversation. Should be good to go. Do you have sound on that? All right, thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Corey McNavin. I'm Director of Development with Hockey Canada. Uh, like a lot of you, I've been in the game for my entire life, been at Hockey Canada for 20 years. Been fortunate to be on the ice with a five year old who's played for the very first time. Been fortunate to spend weeks on end with high performance athletes, Crosby, Stamkos, Tavares, all of our world junior teams, all of our world junior players, all of our world junior coaches. So I've been, been fortunate to been a part of a lot of hockey experiences. I've been a volunteer coach for 20 years. Like many of you guys, I've been part of a minor hockey association from an administration standpoint. And in large part, I've always believed that if you're going to be working at, at Hockey Canada, I shouldn't be someone sitting in the office who hasn't had the opportunity to be the practical experiences. I've been an official, refereed games, I've been parts of all of it. My main job right now is working with people like Steve, with GTHL, OMHA, OHF, Hockey Alberta, Hockey Manitoba, and putting together programs that can be implemented. I'm not a policy maker, I'm not a decision maker. There's a lot of things that happen in our game. If I had my own way, I would make a rule and say we couldn't do this, or yes, we should do this. But it's about putting together information, resources, materials that can make it the game better for coaches. And Tom started off, the initiation program's been around for 35 years. From the very start, the recommendation was all about how do we deal with growth and development of five and six-year-olds? What should the game look like? Should they be using adult sticks that are just cut off? No. Should they be using a regulation puck? No. Should be small area. Everything that's been in there for 35 years, it's been out there. It's been a mandate. It's been a policy to be in every association's bylaws and constitution. The challenge has always been, what are we actually doing with the accountability of it? We've known for a long time that's a better way to teach young kids. We've known for a long time that learning the game in a small area and graduating to full is 10 times more advantageous to producing players versus trying to learn the game on a great big field or a great big ice surface and then having to condense it. And from being in rooms and we have scouts talk at the high performance level about players who don't make a world junior team, who don't make an NHL team, 
It comes down to two things. One, compete level, and number two, their ability to think under stress. And the small area cross ice games is one of the biggest areas that gives those kids that advantage. And whether they go into the NHL, the women's Olympic team, whether they play hockey till peewee, the main components of the game are the ability to think and the ability to want the puck and the ability to go get the puck. When it happens in a small area, even your selects, and I agree, there are six-year-olds that are far better than others, but those six-year-olds would be better as seven-year-olds the more time we put them in a small area with more puck touches, more shots on net, more time on task. The game of hockey now, and I'll show you some information and some stats. Skating full speed in a straight line is not the most important skating skill in hockey. It is acceleration. It is getting from here to the end of that table to get to that puck first. It is being able to turn left, turn right, inside edge, outside edge. Full ice hockey on young kids does not develop the most important skating skills. And we've hear all the commentary. I have people say, well, how are my kids going to get to skate full speed when they can't go full ice? Guess what? There's studies that show that kids get to full speed in 60 feet, 65 feet, which isn't the width of the ice. So when we're looking to develop our high-end six-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds, the small area is going to do that even greater than what it is now. Yes, maybe the game doesn't look like it does traditionally when we grew up, when one kid got the puck from one end and skated to the other, and then one player from the other team skated back down, and eight players didn't even touch the puck for shift after shift after shift. As parents, we were driving over here, and Steve mentioned how long it took us to get to there, here from the airport. I was thinking to myself, and I actually said it to him, I said, good thing we're not going to a game where I'm driving an hour, I'm probably going to be on the ice for 12 minutes, and I'm going to drive an hour back. So in three hours of time frame, not only for you as parents, for the kids, for the brothers and sisters, who are actually going to be active for 12 minutes, and you hope they get to touch the puck every shift, which we know doesn't happen. We hope they're going to get a shot on that every shift, which we know doesn't happen. These are the things that we're trying to do. Our initiation program is not against a grouping of kids. It gives you all kinds of examples on there on how to group kids based on large numbers, based on small numbers. You should have kids of equal skill playing against equal skill. It's better learning abilities for the players. It's better teaching opportunities for the coaches. It's hard to have someone who's out here buzzing around all over the place next to someone who is just walking on the ice. We all know that's difficult. It's not about that. It's about trying to say what we need to do for our players to produce more players at a young age who have better fundamental skills means they're going to play the game longer, without a doubt. Here's a video from USA Tennis to show you this, not just hockey that's looking at, at some of this stuff. A lot of the things I'm going to show you are what you can provide to parents. I know a lot of you guys are, are sold. You believe in small area. It's the parents you have to sell. As Steve mentioned, a lot of the things we're discussing are, is a phenomenon that's going on in North American sport. It's not just in hockey, it's not just in Canada, it's baseball, it's soccer, it's tennis, it's basketball. It's scaling down the game to the appropriate size for the kids so that they can actually develop better. So they will develop better fundamental skills so they'll stay in the game longer and ultimately we're going to produce better players. I hope everyone in here who has kids, sons, daughters, grandkids, want their kids to get to the highest level. 
it's okay to want your kids to get to the NHL or the women's Olympic team or junior hockey or, or get an education paid by it. It's okay. But we're just trying to say if you go about it the right way, they're going to have a better chance. And the pathway is not the same for everybody. Cross-ice, half-ice policy was passed by the Hockey Canada Board of Directors in January of 2017. I'm sure most of you are aware. It's been on the table for a long time to get some standardization to what we do at 5 and 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I know a lot of you are bought in. You see the benefits of it. Your challenge is that you have to go back and talk to parents. You have to go back and convince coaches that this is a better thing. So we're going to try and give you tools. <coughs> There's presentations with the video. Everything we have in here, again, you guys can have. We have an entire presentation that's not an abbreviated one like this on the benefits of cross ice hockey, small area games, what, what should be there. So you can show this to parents. A lot of parents see that first little video I just showed and they're like, you know what? Never really thought about it that way, but it makes sense. Our six-year-olds aren't playing t-ball at Rogers Stadium here. We're not playing basketball with 10-foot nets. But our board of directors is made up of people, representatives from coast to coast. It's not someone sitting in a GTHL office or someone in an OHF office or someone in my office. It's a group of people who from across the country get things put on the table and they vote yes or no. And they voted unanimous that the five and six year old age category should be modified games. Have, and we're, asked the parents, have we asked the parents? Yeah. Absolutely. How many parents do we have in the board across Canada? There's lots of people on the board who are there. Thousands. And have you emailed every parent just ask what they think and not what the board of Hockey Canada says? You also have to understand that in that situation, I'm just asking a question, though. people on the board, so the person from Hockey Manitoba, yeah, is, hockey. is speaking on behalf uh, of the people. Parents and actually, all the parents have gone to the hockey game and state the kids and all that, but you shouldn't be asking them first. And it has gone there. It's not just 13 people who decide. The person in Manitoba who decided that they're going to do that. They've had referendums. They've had people have a say. It's not just a random well, I guess Mrs. decision. Got left out because nobody was about well, we're, we're here to talk about what the policy is. Here's an example of a story that was done in Toronto when it was made. kids age 5 to 6 learning on half rings or smaller ice surfaces. The idea was originally developed more than 35 years ago, though getting organizations from coast to coast to buy in has been an uphill battle for years. We get caught up with the idea of how can we be like the professional player? How can we make these kids professional and the best in Canada when in fact we need to focus on their skills? Ironically, it's a practice also used at the game's highest level. Team Canada's coach couldn't be happier to see it mandated across the country. Oh, she did this great announcement. It should have been happened a long time ago. There's nothing worse than it. It's just pack hockey. You see five chasing the puck over here, five. It, it, it's a waste of time. Tidbits hockey played during intermissions at the Air Canada Center might look cute and be a cool experience for the kids, but according to the top hockey minds, if you increase the space, you increase the pace and a player's development. There's research that suggests that there's uh, five times more touches, six times more passes, two times more contact with other players in close quarters. League superstar Austin Matthews says he knows firsthand that it also makes for way more fun for kids just starting out, learning the good old hockey game for the first time. There's nothing more action, there's a lot more going on, you gotta be aware, so uh, I really think it's, uh, it's a lot more fun than uh, you know, a six-year-old hauling on uh, 200 fights uh, back and forth.
So again, additional resources to talk, to be able to show parents, talk about what the benefits are. So in this presentations with, with video, with, with examples, with, with commentary from NHL coaches and players about the benefits of it that we've put together to, to help associations talk to parents. And as Steve mentioned a lot of times, it's not so much that parents don't think it's a good idea, a lot of them don't know. We've always played five on five full ice, we think that's the best thing to do. The research and the data shows that it's not. As, as an organization, our job is to make sure we put the best information out there so people can make those decisions. Cross ice, half ice. Where is this stuff? Where do you find this information that supposedly exists that we've been looking for since January? It's, it's been out there. We, we send out information through our flow from, from our office. It goes... Where is this information? How can we not, why can we not have this? So, Jeff, the NHL has been historically one of the participators in IT programs year after year. Your coaches have been getting this information on a regular basis. Furthermore, it's always been on our website. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> the NHL has been on the website. All I can say is I'm a special leader and uh, I coach two teams. I haven't seen any of this. So when you took the IP coach level one course, you didn't I, see The only one I've done is the developer one. And I've tried over the last year to do more coaching courses. And there's nothing. So that, the last a, I heard was the, the, the next course I can do is the IP That's course. a fundamental problem, the fact that you took the developer and one and you're coaching both that age group of kids. Well, we don't, that's never been a recommendation. Yeah, I tried to do coaching course in the last year. Okay. Okay. One, one, one second. Okay. Corey's given a presentation. Give him the opportunity to go through it. Okay. Give him the respect. There are, and we'll get to the logistics. Okay. Corey's giving you some information going through it. We'll have that opportunity at the end of Corey's presentation to do it. Show him respect. Just as he's showing us respect to be here, fly across the country to give us the information and support us in the delivery of this program. So I ask you to do that. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Corey. Oh, again, to, when, you, when you talk about information in, in the initiation manual, right, especially from this year when the mandate came out right from March 27th, all the information, the videos, right on our website. If you just go to hockeycan.ca, it was on the front page. If you type in initiation, you'll see all the stuff. Everything is there, the manuals, the administrator's manual. How do you set it up? How do, you, how do you modify games? How do you select your teams? How do you group the, the kids? All the materials that have been there for, for years and years is, came through on, on the relaunch. Our protocol and our ability is we don't have the ability from Hockey Canada to send something to every coach in Canada via email. We have communication channels just like everyone has in your daily businesses and your organizations where we push it out. And a lot of times it will go to the person in your association. Unfortunately, maybe that person isn't there that once they, two weeks after they got the information so it doesn't get passed on. You know, again, we, we do social media, website. It's in all the coaching materials. It's in the coaching clinics. The material is, is out there and it's available. And do I wish we had an opportunity to actually get this in the hands of every parent, every household? Yes, that would make a difference. But at the end of the day, when we look at cross-ice hockey, what we've done in Alberta, what we've done in BC, is you have a game on Saturday at four o'clock that's scheduled between Team A and Team B. Nothing changes. Team A shows up at four, Team B shows up at four. They got black jerseys, they got white jerseys, they have yellow jerseys, they have blue jerseys, whatever the color is. The only difference, instead of having five on five going this way, we have five on five, 
or four on four going this way. This size of the ice, cross ice, is proportionate to the size of the players when you look at full ice and adults. Where did they change? Same dressing room as they did before. No more changes. You only need two. So you have 16 people in the change room. 15 this is, this is team A against team B. And this is team A against team B. So team A is in dressing room one, just like they would for five on five. Team B is in dressing room three, just like they would for five on five. The only difference is you actually split your team in half and they're playing cross ice. The only thing we don't have is two score clocks, to be honest with you. So it, it can be done. When we look at five on five full ice, as Steve mentioned it, 10 kids on the ice, 20 sitting on the bench. You can do this half ice. We didn't say it has to be cross or half. It's, it's modified, it's just not full ice. So you can go half ice, 20 kids on the ice, 10 sitting on the bench. Or if you actually go cross ice, there's no kids sitting on the bench. They're actually playing for the entire time. It's been mandated and they did it in BC all of last year in Vancouver. Actually, in, before the, the policy came out nationally, it was already mandated in nine, in nine provinces. They were, already, they were already doing this with the five and six year olds. Yep. and you've got kids that are chosen and they're playing up. What is the deal with now those kids? Because after those kids have paid money, after parents have, you know, their kids are, have made friends, they're all keen on playing with those kids on their team, and now they're told two days before, I phone Hockey Canada, I phone GTHL and NYHL, nobody could tell me the rule. What is the rule, and if there is a rule, on a kid that's playing up, when was that rule communicated to coaches, to select conveners, to the NYHL, to the GTHL, on a kid playing up? Because it's not fair at this point to say, you've got kids that made your roster last February, last March, April, because you know how crazy it is, February, March, April, and everybody wants to know where the kid is, everybody's moving around, is this coach going to come back? Parents get together, okay, we want you to come back. Okay, we've got three underagers on this team. Okay, and they're on the team. You start collecting money, you get jerseys ordered, you, go, you get your tournaments all lined up. And now two days before a season starts, okay, you've got people that are saying, no, they can't play up. What's, where was the communication on this? From a national level, I can say there's, there's bylaws constitutions from a national level and there's some on local levels and I don't know the ins and outs of local rules. I, I, I can tell you what the national is one but I don't know what every single rule in BC is or whether you're Manitoba or... Says, well, Canada's got to tell us. GTL, GTHL has to tell us. Call GTHL, they said they don't know. Okay. So we're into a... Do you, want, do you want someone to answer it? Do you want someone to answer the question? I can answer the question. Telling us kids can't play up, and they may have played up a year year before. So is that fair to a, a six year old that has to go and say, "See you guys, I'm no longer on your team." Two days before a season starts, is that fair to a parent that's put all their 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 money and their emotions into getting ready for their kid for a hockey season, and they're said they're no longer on the team? Right. So I'll answer your question. From the get-go in the Ontario Hockey Federation, when it went mandatory cross-ice, five and six-year-olds would be cross-ice. We never stopped players from moving up. Players can move up, but six-year-olds still play cross-ice. You want to take six-year-olds up on your seven-year-old team? It's cross-ice hockey. That's, 
no, 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 hey, hey, slow down. Yes, it, but, but just, just relax for a second, because if you, if you listen to the first presentation, we talked about having the span of two years, two groups, spanning across the age group, is not beneficial to those kids. Now you're looking at 48 months worth of uh, their biological age going through it and walking through that situation. So. Okay, so uh, the, the, inter the interesting part about this, and, and I'll speak to, to it from the Ontario Hockey Federation, okay, is that we have the Ontario, uh, Ontario Minor Hockey Association, we have the Alliance Hockey, we have the NOHA, or Ontario Hockey Association, and we have the GTHL, four member partners, okay? It appears that we have one member partner right now, and a portion of one member partner, okay, that's having trouble with the implementation of this, specific to a select program. Okay, and specific to their select program at the seven-year-old age group too, which in the other three member partners, it's been implemented. The messaging is there. The messaging went out in March. 